What do the Salem Witch Trials and Adolf Hitler have to do with profiling? Now the history of profiling and how we got to the modern art and the modern science of criminal profiling is rather interesting and it goes all the way from ritualized murder, the Salem witch trials, through to the development of criminology in the very early days and that would then move over to what we know as the early criminologists. And even during this time, we had profiling or psychological profiling used in the case of Adolf Hitler. Now, this history is interesting in many aspects. Whether it really is that relevant to modern day offender profiling, well, that's another conversation and another argument. But for understanding the history of profiling, it certainly has its place in time. But of course, before we get to that, we need to start by defining what exactly profiling is. So, what is profiling? Well, I think one of the things, first of all, to, to clear up is the misconception that can arise between profiling and stereotyping. So, profiling really refers to the process of making inferences based on observable behaviours or actions. So, it's different from stereotyping, which because stereotyping is really around making categorical perceptions based on behaviours or actions. So in essence, what we're saying is that a profile ascribes characteristics to a, a specific entity or individual, whereas stereo, stereotyping really ascribes characteristics to social groups or segments of society. So that's the main difference. So we need to make sure that we're aware of really what our inferences are driving or what's driving our inferences and where they're being applied to uh, and what they're based on. So there's a few different definitions of, of criminal profiling. In regard to the Petrick and Turvey def definition there, but the emphasis really is that the inferences that are made um, are based on conclusions that really can only be reached around the support of evidence and sound reasoning. So yes, it's the development of inferences to um, determine the person responsible for committing the crime or a series of crimes, but it, those inferences must be made based on quality evidence and also sound and logical reasoning. So, so we set out and looked at what the key definitions of profiling are, but where it gets a little clouded in some respects, and hopefully as we go through the lecture, you'll start to see that we start off quite broad in many aspects when we're thinking about profiling and, and what it might be or might not be. Um, and then as we go through the lecture and certainly get to cases like Jack the River, we see that things start to narrow down and the discipline starts to emerge much more. But it's quite, in many ways, it's, it's a rather messy discipline to begin with, or we wouldn't even really call it a discipline, but some of the things that people might say are either profiles or potentially uh, stereotype behaviour in early days. It's quite clouded and probably one of the best places to start really is looking at things that go that are going back even to the 1100s and the case of, of blood libel, which is really around um, false allegations of someone committing a ritualistic murder of children. So. According to Turvey, who's, who's published on, on this matter, the blood libel is really one of the first documented cases of criminal profiling, which unfortunately resulted in the demonization of, of, of Jewish people. So it was determined that a set of crime-related characteristics was really used to infer and accuse Jews of, of perpetrating murder. And some argument could be made that this was potentially, in actual fact, an example of, of categorical perceptions being made really about a social group. So, you know, these perceptions were made about a social group based on their behaviours and actions, which arguably could be more reflective of, of stereotyping. Um, and probably the first case that this really arose from where the blood libel developed from was the case in with William 
a young a young apprentice child in 1144 who was found dead in Norwich, and an investigation occurred, which was which was run run by monks at the time, and they and the monks claimed or determined that the boy's head was pierced by a crown of thorns, um, and they believed that this occurred or the boy was um, basically sacrificed or considered to be a holy martyr um, and, and an offering to, to draw in pilgrims. So it resulted in the Jews of Norwich being associated with the murder. And as, as Turby discusses in his book on criminal profiling, in the following years, many cases started to arise where a young Christian male would go missing near, near the time of Passover and there would be a Jew Jewish community nearby, um, and the body would have injuries that appeared to be the results of, or what was attributed to the results of a ritual. Um, and, it was, and it was perceived that there was a great deal of blood loss. Um, and then members of a nearby Jewish community would be accused of the murder. And unfortunately, over, over, the, over the 1100s, many Jews were executed due to accusations um, of committing blood libel or ritualistic killings. Um, so they were, either, they were either killed or or uh, mobs sought revenge against them for um, perceiving that they committed these crimes. And unfortunately, even still in the 19th and 20th century, there still has been cases where people or Jewish individuals have been accused of committing ritualistic killings. And a good example of this was in 1911 with Mendel Bayless, who was charged with the killing of a young 13-year-old Christian boy who was found in a cave. And Bayless was jailed for two years while prosecutors built their case. Uh, a witness identified a man with a black beard, and this was enough for him to be charged. And, and the indictment was brought against him that he committed, a, committed the murder out of a religious fanaticism and for ritual purposes with the intention really, they believed, according to the police, of harvesting the child's blood to consume it. So quite interesting in many respects in terms of how that association was drawn. Um, ultimately, the evidence was quite flimsy and he was acquitted at trial. Um, and the belief was that the child was actually murdered by a gang of thieves who believed that the child was going to inform on them um, because he was a friend of the son of one of the gang members. So unfortunately, still this day, there's still groups out there that talk about the role of blood libel um, and also do attribute it to, to Jewish individuals and believe that, yeah, the role of blood plays a, an interesting or significant part um, in terms of people looking to either consume it or make sacrifices with that in regards to, to children. Um, and it's probably, as, as Turby notes, it is interesting because there's certainly a, a set of behaviours that is classified um, or was attributed to Jewish individuals, clearly wrongly so, um, but arguably it could be one of the original cases of, of potentially classifying behaviour. Um, and attributing it, not, not necessarily attributing it to an individual, um, but to a social group. But in my opinion, that probably is more reflective of that stereotype behaviour rather than necessarily profiling. Then we go over to the really around the 1600s and we see a, an interesting time around with witches and, and the Salem witch trial. And... I'm not sure whether I have my pronunciation right here, but the Malleus Maleficarum was published by Heinrich Kramer and Jacob Springer. So they were two Dominican monks and heavily associated with the Catholic Church. And they published this book in 1487, um, which really, in no sort of uncertain terms, was basically a guide to witch hunting. Um, and it was originally published in Latin, but later translated into English in, in 1928. And it really provided basically 
a, a detailed guide to the identification, prosecution, and punishment of witches, and was fully sanctioned by the Catholic Church. So initially, witches were believed to be single white older women. However, as the years progressed, the characteristics became much more looser and, and really it, it seemed to encompass largely most women, but it became more reflective probably of uh, also younger married women as well. So there's a range of characteristics that reflected a witch, um, including things such as having the devil's mark being marked or um, characterised by some possible mental health issues, the use of chemicals or herbs, um, as well as keeping a pet, which was considered to be a demon in animal form. So really, and there was also this a, a number of odd and bizarre beliefs which were prevalent at the time that witches made men impotent and unable to have children. Um, they used spells and charms and also witches were unable to bear children themselves. So, again, a little bit like when we're talking about the case of blood libel, we're, we're looking at some quite considerable generalisations being made about groups of individuals or people based on behaviours and certain physical characteristics that they may have displayed. And probably where a lot of this came to a head was with the Salem Witch Trial, which arguably started, or the, the foundation for it started in 1689 when Reverend Samuel Paris moved with his family to Salem. Um, so he was appointed as the new minister for Salem, but the community over time became unhappy with his ministerial abilities and dispute arose over basically whether the community is willing to continue to pay him. So as a consequence of this dispute, he began really becoming quite disgruntled and started to preach about Satan having hold of the village um, because he was not happy with how he was being treated by the community and also the behaviour. And his message was that Satan had come into the community and that was the reason that the community members were acting that way. And then a couple of years later, in, nine, in, in 1692, his daughter and niece became ill and they, they, had, they presented with a range of symptoms, but part of it was that it was called the disease of astonishment, which was really marked by unexplained illness and, and hysteria. And a local doctor, Dr. William Griggs, was unable to find anything wrong with the girls and concluded that the illness was due to witchery. Um, and this, the Parises, so Reverend Parises, uh, so his family had a slave, and that slave and two other homeless women were charged with causing the girls to become unwell. So Tituba, the slave, confessed that she had led to the children or basically casted, casted a spell on the children and probably largely coerced into a confession through fear. And as time went on, mass hysteria started to develop throughout the village and the surrounding areas. And it was estimated that nearly by the end of the time that the, the women had gone to trial, that around 20 people had been executed um, due to beliefs around them perpetrating witchery, while another 150 had been placed into jail. And I, and I think when we take a step back and look at really probably uh, the behaviour and, and what was going on, this I mean, there's no doubt, there's a notable fear, of, a notable element of fear that's certainly driving a lot of the thinking, along with ostracism and underlying religious beliefs, which are really evident in both the witch hunting and the blood libel matters. And probably the although this overlaps with profiling due to the focus on behaviours and characteristics, there certainly is, and I think we need to be clear on it, there's certainly a degree of categorisation of perceptions which occurs where specific groups are associated with these characteristics. Um, and it's really only when we start to delve into the later criminological writings that emerge 
around the 1800s, and particularly also in the case of Jack the Ripper, that we that we see that crime analysis and the features associated with crime scenes um, begin to become applied to an individual rather than these inferences being made around a broader category of people. So I think that's an important distinction to make that really we start broad and looking at, you know, things being indicative of, of social groups and um, broader categories. But as time goes on, the work refines and becomes much more specific. Um, but we also do go through a period where criminology emerges, where there still is generalizations that are made about what, what constitutes a criminal, but we start to see the emerging pattern of thinking there around refining analysis um, and using potentially uh, at, at that point in time, what might've been considered as evidence and science to make decisions about individuals or criminality. So one of the early people that is arguably considered a, I guess, a criminologist is Eugene Francis Biddock, um, who really was a criminal turned detective. So the French po the French, French police at the time wanted to be at the forefront of criminal investigations and believed that if you wanted to catch a criminal, you had to understand really their thinking processes. So Biddock had a history of crime, um, but he offered his services as, as an informant to the police while he was incarcerated. So he passed on information to the police while incarcerated. Um, and the police chief at the time, Jean Henry, was quite impressed with his work and they, it was arranged for Bidoff to be released from prison. Um, there was a little bit of mystery around whether he was actually released or whether it was made to look like um, he had escaped. So there's, there's some differing opinion around what actually happened, whether he was openly released or whether it was portrayed that he'd escaped from prison. And over the years, he appeared to be given quite a bit of freedom as the years progressed, and he was pl placed in charge of his own detective unit and paid based on the number of criminals that he was able to apprehend. So he achieved quite remarkable results in his arrests and, and, and in his in criminal investigations with his reputation developing within law enforcement. So... In 1827, he published his own memoirs where he basically detailed how effective he was as, as, a, as an investigator um, and also spoke about his time while he was incarcerated. And there's, there's figures that have been thrown around. So he claimed in 1817 that he was responsible for 772 arrests in that year. But as time also progressed, there also appears to be the element of his true character continued to emerge. So there was the rumours around and the suspicion that he was actually perpetrating many of the crimes or arranging to have many crimes perpetrated and then would go about then solving the crime and accusing someone of perpetrating the crime. So he was ultimately removed from office or removed from his role in 1832. And he ended up back in custody over time with further accusations and charges arising. Uh, and this really related to him committing crimes um, and also a, being associated with a range of fraud offences. So there's a thinking, there's a line of thinking that really did he ever stop criminally offending and did his role with the police allow him really to become a greater criminal and have greater access to things. But he's certainly been a, a bit of a controversial subject over the years. Um, and, and it's been suggested that he's inspired several writers, including Edgar Allan Poe and also Victor Hugo. So quite a prominent character for, and, and probably quite notorious in many aspects for what he was able to do. But interesting to look at how some of his work or the idea of police trying to tap into the mindset of that the criminal thinking style as a way of being ahead ahead of how criminals may perpetrate their crimes. And probably the next main figurehead that we see in the criminology space is Cesar Lombroso. 
who published his book, The Criminal Man. And, and this was definitely a pioneering book for the time. So he published this in 1876 and it had, and it was based on his statistical analysis of Italian prisoners. Um, and probably when we look back at his thinking, it's largely evolutionary and anthropological. So it's really bringing those approaches to understanding criminal behavior. And he proposed the born criminal and the insane criminal and suggested that the born criminal was a person that was quite degenerative and had a poor evolutionary development, um, while the insane criminal really was a person suffering from mental illness or, and phys or physical illness. So according to Lombroso, there were many characteristics, particularly physical features, um, that described or depicted or that would capture a criminal. So based on these characteristics, you could pick whether someone was inclined to be a criminal or particularly a born, the born criminal. And this included things such as deviation in head size, twisted nose, asymmetry of the face, an unusual ear size, receding of the chin, excessive arm length, um, and also abnormalities with the hair. So it really, in essence, what, what he would attribute this to was to the mark of Cain. So these features would be a, a symbolism for, for criminality. And it's, I think his work is, is interesting and it, it starts to look at using evidence um, and statistical analysis to make decisions about criminal behaviour, although I think we would, would probably would clearly say that certainly while it might have been interesting at the time, as time has, has developed, we certainly know that making judgments based on people's physical appearance is a very flawed approach, very, very flawed process to uh, trying to make a judgment based on criminality or anything in general. So we then start to get more now into a refinement of the, of, of the discipline and start to get probably some greater experts and some greater writings and opinions offered by some really leading individuals. And one of the, the people that's been cited as the founding father of probably you know criminology or criminal profiling is Hans Gross. And he published his book, Criminal Investigations, a practical textbook for magistrates, police officers, and lawyers, which is arguably still considerably, considerably relevant to modern day criminology. And he, he wrote about pioneering terms such as modus operandi or, or the method of operating um, in committing a crime and emphasised the importance of understanding the methods and techniques by which offenders commit a crime. So his work really emphasised the importance of, of using evidence and logic and applying that to criminal investigations. And then we have Richard von Kraft Ebbing and probably doesn't necessarily fit in the mold of a criminologist. So he was a German psychiatrist, but his work really is a pivotal piece because it starts to look at the role of really psychopathology and the relationship that that has with criminality. And he published the book Psychopathic Sexualis um, in 1886. And it looks at deviant sexual behavior and pathology and particularly met many odd and bizarre sexual behaviors or offenses such as, such as necrophilia. Um, and his last edition of the book, which was authored by him, contained 238 case studies related to human sexual behavior and psychopathology. And many of those have intersect with, with criminality um, so that work was quite important for understanding, particularly when we look at a, a case like Jack the Ripper, which emerged um, around this time as well, and then some of the other cases that developed following this. But when we're looking at understanding pathology and, and unusual sexual behaviour or the role of sexual behaviour and really in driving potentially some of the criminal motivations, um, his work has been quite pivotal to that. And, and his work also has influenced the Netflix show, The Alienist, for any of you that might have, have seen that, or certainly worth a watch to put things into sort of perspective about what it meant at the time. 
The other person that was quite a big and influential person at the time, and by, by no means is necessarily a criminologist, but certainly ventured into the criminal criminology space, is Sir, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, and Conan Doyle was, was deeply impressed by the skills of a doctor that he studied under, Dr. Joseph Bell, who was able to observe really the most, according to Conan Doyle, observe the most minute details regarding a patient's condition. And it's believed that the Sherlock Holmes character is really modelled off Dr. Bell. And, and Conan Doyle, in his writing, emphasised the, the importance of deduction. So that was really the, the sort of principle that underlied the, the thinking of Sherlock Holmes. And it was around astute, the astute observation of details and features in a crime scene. Um, and developing premises or hypotheses to then test, and through through the process of testing these, the person would would arrive at a deductive conclusion about the crime scene or the offender. Um, and quite interestingly, how he does portray things in the book, we have the you know the mindset of Holmes, which is really around that observation premise and deduction, and then the other side of it is is the mindset of Dr. Watson, who's much more emotion and assumption based and probably relies on the inductive method. And Conan Doyle was also quite an advocate for post-conviction case review. And he himself was involved in reviewing some cases that he believed were really reflective of miscarriages of justice. And it, I guess it's interesting to look at how influential he was in these cases uh, and whether his opinions were accurate or reflective of what he claimed them to be. Um, but there's certainly two cases where he was involved in and, and was quite a strong advocate in the cases that did end up actually potentially, the argument is that they, I think that definitely for the case of uh, Georgia Daly, that it it certainly resulted in his case being viewed differently. And then in the other case we'll discuss in the event around Oscar Slater, it seemed that again that Conan Doyle's work was quite influential in, in pushing for his case to be reviewed as well. So in terms of the case of Georgia Daly, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's what we'll go with. So he was an Indian man that was convicted of the killing and mutilation of animals. So around so he in 1892, um, some things first started with, with the family or his family um, when he was 16 years old. And the Adalias received, began receiving threatening letters in the post. And as the years progress, um, the harassment kept going um, and it seemed to be directed at the head of the family, so at, at George's father. But... It also, in time, coincided with the mutilation of several animals in the area. So this was the sheep, the cows, and horses um, in, in the lot sort of on the local farms. And in the wake of these incidents, the police again received um, more anonymous letters. And some of these accused, accused George Adalia of committing the crimes. So the local police acted was well, they hadn't acted, but they were suspicious and. They put a surveillance on George, um, but unfortunately that wasn't necessarily successful as more crimes still occurred um, and another animal was mutilated, even though the police were watching George's house at the time. So a pony was mutilated with its stomach being sliced open. But the police believed that George was the culprit and according to reports and particularly in Conan Doyle's writing of the case, um, the police acted quite hastily and arrested George. Uh, and by the time that he had left for work that day, they searched his house, they confiscated a pair of muddy shoes, they'd taken his pants, which had dirt on them, um, and they'd also taken some razor blades from his house. Um, and while he was in Custody. Conan Doyle, we can't, there, was, there was quite a bit of public outcry around his arrest and Conan Doyle became involved in the case 
and according to him, he reviewed the evidence and believed that the police had made mistakes in the conviction of George. So he identified what he believed to be many in inconsistencies in the evidence, um, and most of these related to things such as the soil being different on the boots of George's on George's boots, so they didn't match the soil that was found in the paddocks where the animal animals were mutilated. He believed that the bloody razors were merely rusty razors and it wasn't in fact blood on them. Um, he also noted that the handwriting expert had previously made errors on another case, therefore his testimony couldn't be reliable. But probably what stands out most about the case, and I guess it's very Sherlock Holmesy or Sherlock Holmes-esque, is that he went to meet with George and while George was sitting in the waiting room, he noticed that George had pulled the paper, the newspaper that he was reading, very close up to his eyes, and it tilted the newspaper slightly on a sideways angle, which, according to Conan Doyle, proved that he had that George had a high degree of myopia, myopia, but all, and also a marked astigmatism. So he put all this information together, sent a report to a committee. And based on particularly Conan Doyle's beliefs around George's vision, he argued that George would not have been able to, to scour the fields at night and assault the cattle as he simply would not have been able to see due to his vision impairments. Uh, interestingly, um, based on his, his advocacy in the case, um, George was in it. Was, it was, his conviction was overturned by a committee um, in 1907 and he was determined to be innocent of the mutilations although he was still uh, still found guilty of writing the letters in regard to the, writing the letters to the police and then we move on to the case of Oscar Slater and, and probably Conan Doyle's I guess his influence in this case is probably not as prominent um, and I think there's probably question marks around I guess how much of, of it has been attributed to him because I think the things that he certainly advised in the case were not necessarily I don't think groundbreaking things that would have necess would, would have been enough to um, prove the, the offender's innocence but Oscar Slater was charged with the murder of an older lady or an elderly lady, Marion Gilchrist, and she lived with a young maid servant, Helen, in her in her flat. And on the twenty first of December, nineteen oh eight, Marion was murdered at around seven pm after her maid servant Helen had gone out to buy the evening newspaper and do a few errands. So she was found bludgeoned to death in the dining room and the evidence suggested that Marion may have known her attacker and when Helen returned, she noticed a man heading down the stairs as she re-entered the building and also a 14-year-old girl who was in the street at the time spotted a man hurrying out of the building. Um, so descriptions were given of the man but although the descriptions didn't necessarily match Oscar Slater. Um, the police were already quite interested in him due to his quite unsavourable history. So he'd been known by the police. Um, and then in the following days, he had some rather unusual movements, which maybe suggested that he was potentially trying to flee and hide. So um, he left. He left Glasgow, really, basically immediately following the crime. Um, then on Christmas Day, rented a motel room or a hotel room with a female companion. Then the next day, he was found to be boarding an ocean liner which was headed to New York. So, so he had a bit of a troubled past. Being he was a described as a disreputable foreigner. Um, and had been associated with prostitutes, thieves, and burglars. And it seemed that the police, and, and along with being 
Long was sort of coupling his movements together after the crime, felt that he was quite a good fit for the crime. Um, and it, well, arguably the police were correct at the time and he, based on the evidence, he was found guilty um, and sentenced to execution. So again, there was, there was a reasonable public reaction to Oscar being sentenced and particularly sentenced to execution. Um, and, and Conan Doyle became once again involved as an advocate in the case. So according to Conan Doyle, he reviewed the case materials and identified that the medical examiner's report had declared that a large chair, which was dripping with blood, was in fact the murder weapon rather than the hammer, which Slayer was believed to have murdered Marion with. Um, and he also believed that Marion had opened the door herself. So based on the fact that there was no evidence of forced entry, um, he surmised that the murderer, or that Marion didn't know the murderer, um, and therefore the murderer couldn't have, well, sorry, that the Marion knew the murderer, um, and that as she did not know Slater, it couldn't have been her. So that she will willingly let the, the murderer in, having known them, um, but she never, never had a known relationship with Slater, so therefore Conan Doyle concluded that it couldn't have been him. And interestingly, the later on, the 14-year-old female witness came forward um, and stated that the police had pressured her into identifying Slater as, as the person that she saw. So uh, the years progressed um, and there was a book that was published on the case, not by Conan Doyle, but um, obviously with him continuing to, to write letters and the book being published on the case. Um, an appeal occurred in 1928 and the prosecution, the, well, the appeal determined that the prosecution had been, had misdirected the jury. Uh, and based on this, after nearly, after Slater having been in prison for nearly 20 years, he was released um, and went on to, to be a free man after that. So it's quite interesting looking at Conan Doyle's involvement. I think obviously he was an advocate for, for some of these cases but I think we'd also be tentative to say that you know, his, his influence um, probably above and beyond these cases was substantial in criminology, um, but certainly his writings I, paved way and, and emphasised the role of really using a systematic process or a systematic way of thinking to, to solve crimes or go about solving crimes. So, certainly has an influence on on the role of maybe where criminology proceeded to go in the coming years around using science along with some of the other key criminologists that we've discussed but i think we we, we might be a bit more cautious in saying that um he was necessarily the real life version of sherlock holmes so we jump on from but still saying that we jump on from Conan Doyle, but still staying in the same same time period to really, I think, where criminal profiling starts to take shape, um, and we start to move away from broader assumptions around criminality to looking at crime scene behaviour and what that potentially says about an offender, or what it, what inferences can be made about an offender. So the Jack the Ripper case is it's a fascinating one. I'm sure you I'm sure you've all heard of it. Everyone in the field seems to have at one point in time tried to offer an opinion or uh, write a paper on who they think Jack the Ripper is, and you you will get the chance as well to do that in in your assignment. But as you delve into this case, it is I mean it, it's a fascinating case. It's quite a it's quite a horrific case. Um, and I think probably at a superficial level, um, those details, particularly the, the mutilation is not well understood, but when you start to read um, up on the case, the, the level of mutilation is, is nothing really short of, of horrific. Um, and 
probably something that I think when you're doing your assignments, it'll be very interesting to analyze you know, what role the mutilation played in, in the killer's, I think, motivation and also maybe what they were able to, what the sort of the, how the offense was basically a source of fulfillment for them. So in 1888, there were five prostitutes that were murdered and mutilation was a primary feature in all but one of the cases. Interesting, some interesting thinking around why prostitutes were murdered. Um, there's some argument that it's by former FBI agent John Douglas that the victims were, char were targeted due to ease and accessibility um, and prostitutes tended to service dark alleys at the time. Um, according to Rumbelow, prostitution was also quite prominent at that period of time due to the extreme poverty. Um, Rumbelow estimated that around one in 16 women engaged in this trade, um, that there may have been up to 1,200 prostitutes in the Whitechapel area, which is where the Jack the Ripper murders occurred, um, and up to 80,000 prostitutes in London. So quite exceptional figures. Um, whether whether the, the victims were chosen, though, due to accessibility, I guess that's something um, that, that's always been debated, but it certainly seems to be probably a prominent theme of thinking. Um, and the level of mutilation um, was, as I was saying before, was quite extreme, but there was a lot, there was a, really a range of body parts that um, were removed by the killer. Um, and that range from kidney, vagina, nose, breast, um, but all, all four, bar all four victims um, had elements of significant mutilation. It was just the one that didn't have that. And there were some thoughts that th there was an absence of mutilation due to potentially the killer being interrupted. So the victims, so there's five, five victims. So the first was Marianne Nicholas, and she was found dead on the 31st of August, 1888. Um, so her throat was cut from ear to ear, and her abdomen was cut from the center of the base of the ribs along the, light, on, along the right side, um, and it was believed to be with a bladed knife. So following her murder, a couple of weeks later, Annie Chapman was found dead, and she was a 37-year-old. She was found with a, a swollen face and tongue, which suggested that she was initially strangled. Um, portions of her small intestines um, and parts of her abdomen were found lying on the ground, um, but they were still attached to her body. It, but it gave the appearance, or the thinking was, that they'd been pulled out um, part of her abdomen wall. Um, with the navel, the uterus, the upper part of the vagina, uh, and also parts of the bladder were removed and missing. Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes were believed to be basically murdered within a very short time period on the same day, so in the early hours of uh, the 30th of September, 1888. So, the, so Elizabeth Stride didn't have significant evidence of mutilation. And the thinking there is that, and it tends to be a bit of a consensus, that the, the killer was interrupted. Um, and then what followed was the murder of Catherine. Um, and again, a very, very horrific murder. She was severely butchered and dissected. Her throat was cut. Her abdomen was completely severed. A section of her intestines were lying on the ground and her left kidney was removed. Now, where it gets, I don't know if interesting is the right word, but where it gets somewhat fascinating or complex is that following Catherine's murder, approximately two weeks later, George Lusk, who was the president of the Whitechapel Committee, received a small cardboard box 
and the letter was, which which was accompanied with the letter title from hell, and inside the box was half a kidney. So according to the memoirs of Major Henry Smith, who was involved with the case, and, and the memoirs were published approximately 20 years after the case, Catherine had advanced stages of Bright's disease, and he believed that the kidney scent was in the exact same stage of health. Um, but many criminologists have come to believe also that the kidney was a hoax, uh, along with other letters that were signed by Jack the Ripper. But that's something that I think in your assignments will be really worth investigating and trying, trying to get to the bottom of that a little bit more. And then arguably probably the most horrific murder was that of Mary Kelly on November 9th or November 8th, I should say. 1888 inside her house. Uh, she was 20 years of age and three months pregnant. Slightly different from the other murders in that um, this one occurred inside and a great deal of time was spent by the killer at the scene. Her head and left arm were mostly severed. Her breasts and nose were cut off. Thighs and forehead were skinned um, and her body parts were piled up on the bedside table. So most investigators believe that the Ripper stopped after this killing, probably for reasons that really nobody knows. Um, but there is an argument or a thought that there potentially was a sixth victim, but that will be that will be something that I won't touch on, but I think in your assignments uh, will be very valuable to investigate and explore. So in terms of the crime scene inferences that were that were drawn from the case, so there's, there's really two leading physicians um, at the time, and the first is Dr. George Phillips. So both Dr. Phillips and Dr. Bond believe that the crime scene behaviour of the killer, um, based on the medical, the crime scene behaviour would provide details about the character and personality of the killer based on the medical evidence and inferences that could be drawn from that. So Dr. George Phillips believed that the postmortem removal of the organs required precision and skill and he inferred that the, that the killer had a knowledge of anatomy based on the cleanliness and incisions of the wounds. Dr. Thomas Bond though had a slightly different opinion and he, he probably is the main person that's often linked with the case and really provided what is the profile of, of Jack the Ripper based on his medical review. So he was requested to review the case by the police and he determined that the cause of death for each victim was having their throat cut. Interestingly, he believed that um, the women were all murdered when lying down based on the arterial blood splatter. Um, and he argued that the killer suffered from, gosh, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this very well, but satyriasis, hopefully that's correct, which really is, it's an, unex, it's, it's an excessive and uncontrollable sexual desire. Um, and I had a little bit of a different thinking to Dr. Phillips in that he didn't believe that the, basically the, the wounding patterns um, was reflective of a specialised anatomical knowledge um, and that he also thought that the main purpose of the murder was for the act of mutilation. So very interesting, we start to really look at what that crime scene behaviour um, and the evidence, particularly from the medical examination, can tell us and then using that knowledge to start to infer characteristics about about the offender. So I think when we're really thinking about the Jack the Ripper case, it's it's one of the, the, the key cases and key things to, to think about and study for offender profiling because the the early work particularly by, by Dr. Thomas Bond um, showed the value in inferences being drawn from um, particularly a medical examination but also the examination of the crime scene. And we have to remember, you know, at that point in time as well, it, it, those inferences were really mainly draw from, drawn from the medical examination, not actually from 
people being experts in crime scene behaviour. We then jump to the, the application of psychological principles and behavioural theories used in a slightly different context. So it, still inferring and making um, inferences about a person but used in the in the context of, of the military. So a slight shift from the Jack the Ripper case, but we start to see more the role of psychology becoming a prominent aspect in, in strategy and approaches to understanding human behaviour. And the adoption of the military of, of psychological principles in the 1940s was, was a really interesting component, I think, during these war times, particularly um, with the aim of using psychological principles to influence their strategy in the 1940s. And the Office of Strategic Service commissioned an analysis of the personality of Adolf Hitler. So the Office of Strategic Service was a section of the US Army which was tasked with gathering intelligence during the war. And we had two individuals, so Walter Langer and Henry Murray, which were commissioned by the Office of, Strategic, Office of Strategic Service to basically produce a profile and a personality analysis of Adolf Hitler and of Adolf Hitler. And their background was in psychodynamic theory, which was really the dominant mode of, of psychological practice at the time. So they both published their reports in 1943. So according to Murray, Hitler was a pervasive narcissist um, and really he craved, he craved superiority, which, which he tried to achieve through extracting revenge and trying to dominate others. Um, and this was really done to relieve deep underlying beliefs of, of inferiority, which drove a lot of his behaviour. So, like Langer, Murray, in many ways, tried to predict what the likely outcomes for Hitler were. So, he offered eight possible outcomes in terms of, I guess, profiling what may become of Hitler. So, there's a, there's a number of these, such as um, the emphasis on how Hitler may have become more increasingly neurotic through to potentially going insane, um, with Murray believing that he had the makeup of a paranoid schizophrenic um, and, that and that repeated setbacks may actually crack his resistance. There's also the thinking that he may get killed in battle so that he may want to die as a hero. Um, and then we have one of the more prominent ones that he may commit suicide um, and, and this seemed to arise due to the fact that Hitler, was, Hitler had previously vowed um, and spoken about his plans to commit suicide if his plans were miscarried. So if, they, if, if he wasn't successful, basically, um, that would be it. He would, he would take control of things himself and not surrender um, and not let the other other armies or other forces have a say in his life. So there was also the belief that Hitler would kill himself in quite a dramatic fashion. And this was probably echoed in the report by, by Langer as well. So he also believed that there was the underlying theme of narcissism to Hitler, um, characterised by a messiah complex, um, and that he was potentially having some difficulties with, with sexual behaviour as well, which may be reflected by his, his underlying neuroses, um, whether it was psychological or physical that was causing him to be impotent. Um, and like Murray, Langer offered, not instead of nine, he offered eight uh, possible outcomes for Hitler. Um, and Quite, there's, I mean, these don't really differ enormously between the reports of both, both psychoanalysts, but there's certainly been a lot of commentary on um, Langer's profile. And most notably, it, it comes back to 
playing as prediction that Hitler would commit suicide. So, but again, like like Murray, um, Langer also noted that Hitler had frequently threatened to commit suicide at points during his life, um, and predicted that Hitler would become more and more neurotic over time, um, and that each defeat of Hitler would shape, would continue to shake his confidence. Um, and rattle that perception of his own greatness, uh, which which was likely then to further perpetuate potential the potential likeliness of of suicidality. So the the thinking from Langer was that as a consequence, he'd feel more and more vulnerable um, to attack, become more and more paranoid, and potentially also have greater emotional outbursts. Probably more what's what's interesting, and I guess it's reflective of that psychoanalytic perspective, that he believed that Hitler would lock himself up in a symbolic womb, uh, which was re meant to represent his bunker at the time, and defy the world of being able to get at him by taking his own life. So there's certainly, when we look at the profiles of Hitler, it, it's certainly been something that's really received a lot of attention over the years and there's been a lot of emphasis on just how accurate they were, but really in many ways, it's the, the predicted outcomes by both Langer and Murray are really sort of a process of elimination in many ways. I, I guess you could argue it in terms of nearly being akin to a risk assessment. So all those different scenarios are stated there, and then it's looking at the evidence that says what's most likely through to potentially what's least likely. Um, and, and given, you know, the review of Hitler's history of behaviour, particularly his neuroses, level of paranoia, um, the desire to be dominant and in control, and also having spoken about suicidality, it probably wasn't a huge step to uh, make the association that he may go down the path of committing suicide. But it's certainly been something that was heralded, heralded as, as a, huge success of criminal profiling over the years, but maybe not necessarily uh, reflective of, of, the sh of, I guess, really you know, sound inference making. It might have just been really that it was a logical conclusion to reach based on um, an analysis of his, of his life. So the very early days of profiling are very abstract. Some of you may argue that really it has nothing to do with profiling and in some ways there's probably some argument that maybe we are clutching at straws by trying to draw comparisons between modern day profiling and even the Salem witch trials but essentially what we're talking about is decisions and assumptions were made in these early days about individuals and what the traits of these individuals were and that has then progressed through time to looking at whether we can make generalizations about characteristics of a person and that has then started to become even more focused and refined and we see in the profile around Adolf Hitler we start to look at the individual psychological traits of a person and this really becomes the launch pad for the future development of what we know as criminal profiling.